so uh, today uh, we are going to talk about a very important topic <clears throat> so we covered uh, um, the opioids um, and uh, we also talked about uh, how to manage pain with opioids <clears throat> but uh, we have to understand that uh, there have been uh, a lot of work uh, which has uh, gone uh, into this uh, particular field to make uh, the opioids available for medical use uh because many of the <clears throat> governments uh, were regulating the opioid use uh so uh, even though uh, it should be available for pain management but uh, we should also ensure that it is used properly uh, so today's topic is opioid access the principle of balance uh, access without access and uh, uh, we have uh, a very famous uh, person with us and dr jim cherry um so presently he is the professor and the walter senior chair of uh, supporting oncology at indiana university of indiana university school of medicine and uh, he is the medical director and director of supportive oncology at indiana university simon comprehensive cancer center uh, so he graduated in 1984 uh, and uh, followed by that uh, he also trained in general medicine as well as in medical oncology and immediately after that uh, he uh, conducted research on opioid pharmacology um, at department of uh, pharmacology at the university of adelaide um and uh, then um uh, he uh, he became uh, the program director of uh, cancer control at the uw carbon cancer center integrating palliative care into that program and as a chair of uh, UWCC and the scientific review committee uh, then he moved on to a university of wisconsin wisconsin and uh, he was recognized as a top doctor um, and the most importantly he became the director of pain and policy studies group from 2011 to 2018 and called the global opioid policy initiative that reviewed uh, the opioid availability in Uh, most of the developing countries and uh, low resource countries and uh, believe me even if i read for half an hour uh, his um, um the um things which we which he has sent i cannot finish it uh, so um um then um, then presently uh, he has been appointed as the who global breast cancer initiative as co leader of the cancer treatment working group and uh, he and he was uh, um, awarded uh, or uh, he is recognized as the uh, one of the uh, palliative care visionary uh, by american academy of hospice and palliative medicine um uh, so there are many more feathers to his cap but uh, um Uh, with this uh, short introduction i would like to welcome dr jim cleary and uh, i have seen him during various conferences uh, so dr jim it's out to you i have to find the unmute button which is always interesting my screen sharing is absurd. okay paused i don't want to do that Oh. Resume sharing. Good. We're back there. I am uh, talking to you from India um Vienna, um Austria, where I had the pleasure yesterday of actually meeting with the head of the International Narcotic Control Board, who is the former chief of uh, uh controlled medicines in India, who has now moved to Vienna as on the International Narcotic Control Board. So it was really delight to uh, work with her, meet with her. I actually my first experience in India was to visit in 1966 on my way back from uh, uh Europe my father was uh, working in England and we stopped in Delhi um still a a strong memory for an 8 year old at that stage and then I went back again in 1983 um and worked in Calcutta for 3 months as a medical student um which was really quite significant and have been back many times since with the Indian Association of Palliative Care and with Pallium India 
So I'm going to let me know if my Australian accent gets too fast. It can sometimes do that, and I will try not to, um, making sure that we understand each other's English. But I'm just going to start with a video, and I hope the videos transmit, but let's give this a go. Savage war. Rat infested trenches. Include this because there's a, there's a number of particular points that if we look at the image of the United States at the moment from our magazines, most painful, powerful painkillers, creating the worst addiction crisis that America has ever seen. But I also wanted to use the first footage because I was at a side event at the Commission on Narcotic Drugs here in Vienna, and we had the ambassador from Netherlands, um, as well as Belgium, Australia, talking about the need to improve access to opioids. But he started with, he said, let me personalize this. I just saw the movie All Quiet on the Western Front. And to watch the agony of the pain of the soldiers, as this video describes, without appropriate pain relief. And this still goes on, not just for soldiers, but for many people in the world, that they don't have access to medicines. And this is even true that we have this situation here, where we have um, a, a story that uh, candidate Clinton, when she was running for president, actually said it was incomprehensible that the FDA approved sustained release oxycodone for children. And you sit there and say, well, why not? Children need these medicines, and surely it's appropriate that we do studies to show that it's safe to give these in children with cancer and other conditions. But such is the process that we've created in the United States that anything to do with opioids now is actually toxic. And here is the WHO guidelines, which have been put out for persistent pain in children with medical illnesses. So the WHO has recognized this. The Lancet Commission has addressed this abyss in palliative care and pain relief. And you will see Dr. Roger Kapol's name um, way up there on the list as a senior author for this publication. It really does highlight it. But if we actually look at the different countries with their consumption of opioids, you will find it difficult to identify India there. And I think it's this little thing here with Sri Lanka hanging off the tail, as opposed to Australia somewhat bloated, but the United States and Canada very bloated. Interestingly, Europe, much the same size that you would expect it to be but almost all of South America, Asia, um, and Africa not recognizable because their consumption is so low. So that's what I want to talk about today, is how do we get to ensuring access without excess um, as we move forward in the principle of balance. A few years ago, I was asked to speak at a meeting in Thailand for the Asian Pacific Hospice Network, and Dr. Ednan had asked me to talk on the integration and harmony of wisdom. He always comes up with interesting topics. Um, so what is wisdom? And as particularly, this is a master's class, I wanted to bestow on you my thoughts on some wisdom. Um, wisdom, on the other hand, resists automatic thinking seeks to understand ambiguity better, to grasp the deep, deeper meaning, and to understand the limits of knowledge. Because I think there is a lot of ambiguity in the data that we see from the United States and other places around the world, and it'd be important for us to actually interpret this. Um, so we're going to review what I consider the opioid crisis, the importance of balance, and I list that here are some associations of interest. I don't necessarily call them conflicts. Some are associations, but we should declare them. And it is true that for five, six years, Pain and Policy Studies Group, before I was director, actually did some re receive some pharmacological industry support, all consistent with the WHO conflict of interest rules. And we were never told that we had a problem. So I actually think there are a number of crises going on. There is the ongoing pain crisis in that we have untreated pain in many places. We did have a prescription opioid crisis in the United States. Then came a heroin crisis, fentanyl crisis, but 
ongoing is the globioid opioid crisis with people lacking access to the appropriate pain medicines. Historically, if we go back and look at hospice and palliative care, the first hospice, as we really know it, was in France in 1842, many of them associated with religious organizations. But you can see here a hospice started in New York in 1899, not 1999. That is not a typographical mistake. 1899. It has been around for many, many years. Um, morphine identified in 1811. Um, it really became popular in the United States. Popular is probably not the right word. More commonly used with the development of the hypodermic syringe uh, in the middle of the 19th century. And it was particularly used, therefore, during the Civil War in the United States. Heroin was synthesized, and really, heroin, if to remind you, is diacetylmorphine. Um, it's actually two acetyl molecules on morphine, which makes it more soluble. And it was synthesized in 1874. And Bayer Pharmaceuticals, the maker of aspirin, marketed this in the late 19th century as a cough mixture and believing it would be less, less um, addictive than morphine itself. Little did we know at that time. So we're just repeating ourselves over and over again with these. Uh, India very much caught up in the, um, the opium wars with China, um, and it was really a very significant fact going forward. Um, the poppies largely grown as they still are up in the northwest of India, um, Rajasthan and uh, the Punjab area is still common places for poppies to be grown. Much of the poppies grown in India to this day are converted back to codeine in factories so that we can give them into our body, so the body will break them down to morphine. It's a rather ridiculous process that we go through, um, and expensive one to do that, much better to just give morphine. But it was because of those opium wars um, and what was happening at the turn of the century, uh, the, the 20th century, the International Opium Commissions met Shanghai, and um, there was actually uh, conventions established but interestingly enough, and almost like today, the US and China pulled out of those conventions. So life is just a repeating circle. Um, here we go. We should get a next slide. Yeah, so in the United States, if we look at this, um, it was actually believed that opium was less of a problem than alcohol, but there was strong prohibition came in for both alcohol and opioids the Harrison Act and then the Dangerous Drug Act. And we saw up until World War II, tw some 25,000 doctors were up on narcotic charges and 3,000 went to jail. It was interesting that during World War II with the drying up of the Golden Triangle, as they called it, around Thailand and, and Burma, as it was known then, Myanmar, there was almost no opioids available in the West. And so therefore very little addiction actually seen at that time. I also highlight this, going back to the war analogies stories, every US soldier who landed in D-Day in Normandy actually had morphine on them. And they were actually identified that it was important that the soldiers had morphine available to them. And there was no evidence that there was any abuse of this morphine on, in the, amongst these soldiers as they went forward. Um, if we look at the other opioids that we discovered, the Germans were prolific in developing the different opioids, oxycodone in 1916, hydrocodone, pethidine or Demerol as we uh, know it in the United States, and then in 1938, methadone. And methadone was developed under the name Dolorfin from the German Dolorfin, end pain. So it was developed as a pain medicine in Germany. Uh, at this same time, as much of this was going on, uh, Dame Cecily Saunders, or Cecily Saunders, originally a nurse and a social worker and a, and a physician, was working in St. Luke's Hospice I'm sorry, um, and really a step worked out that the nuns were giving morphine every four hours. 
And this had been started in the 1920s and 30s by this group of nuns who realized that morphine given every four hours resulted in better pain control. And Cecily Saunders documented this, published it, and it was really that that went forward to become the why we use opioids. Dame Cecily went on to start St. Christopher's, which was very significant. 1960s, we saw the development of fentanyl by Paul Janssen in uh, um, Belgium. And this was really the first significant uh, a synthetic opioid as we know it at the time. But around this time, the UN was actually creating the single convention of narcotic drugs. And so we've got these medicines out there and you will tr I will try to use the words medicine all along and not drugs, but this is the single convention of narcotic drugs. So I can't change the wording of this but it established a framework to prevent abuse and diversion and ensure the availability. This was not restrict availability for medical purposes. It really was, how do we make sure we have this available? Many people say that this single convention, the tobacco single convention is the first UN declaration on healthcare. I would put it to you that it's the single convention for opioids that is the uh, most significant uh, factor going forward. And what the language says is the need for narcotic drugs continues to be indispensable for the relief of pain and suffering and adequate provision must be made to ensure access of these uh, for medical purposes. This is the single convention of narcotic drugs. What you'll see in some of these graphs going forward is in fact that the uh, You'll see consumption for different countries. This is morphines per person over time, starting back in the 60s. At this time, a number of studies were going on, and here are two of the greats of the uh, uh, palliative care. Robert Twycross, who a frequent visitor to India, um, who many of you will, may have met or heard. And he was actually studying the use of heroin for palliative care in the United Kingdom. And they found that to be quite useful. Balfour Mount was doing studies with opioids in Canada, where he started the palliative care programs there. And he was actually doing comparison of morphine versus the Brompton cocktail. And what was in the Brompton cocktail, uh, some morphine, some cocaine, some cannabis, a little bit of gin, some syrup to take away the bitterness and some chloroform water. And people can say, wow, this is a recipe from the 1880s published in the Lancet then um, by a Dr. Snow. And I have prescribed Brompton's cocktail in my lifetime, a professional life. So this is not a new thing, but we were still using for pain control, a cocktail that was developed in the late 1800s going forward. You can see not much increase in opioid consumption as we move forward. 77, the WHO said, let's develop a model list for medicines and included in that were codeine, and both injectable and tablets of immediate release morphine at that stage. This is a picture of my own parents. My mother was a hospice nurse, my father a physician uh, who did research and education. My mother worked in Mary Potter Hospice and she went and spent three months in, uh, in London with Dame Cecily Saunders and came back in, in my, while I was a medical student, gave the first dose of oral morphine in Adelaide, Australia. And guess what? The patient didn't die and everyone was quite amazed and said, oh. So that was a start even in, it's relatively new in my professional career that we've been doing this. And I think we lose perspective of that at times. One of the reasons I moved to Wisconsin in the uh, 1990s was because of the work of the uh, Wisconsin Cancer Pain Initiative. In the 1970s, people in Wisconsin, June Dahl, a professor of pharmacology, and David Joranson, who ran the Wisconsin Controlled Substances Board, were actually asked to look at the use of heroin for pain relief. And this is based on the English example, and heroin is still commonly used for pain control in hospice in the United Kingdom. Um, it's medically controlled, and there does not seem to be much diversion. Um, so the Controlled Substances Board inter, uh, initiated studies in the Wisconsin Cancer Pain Initiative with support of the White House and others and showed they could increase the consumption of morphine for cancer pain with no increase in morphine-related crime. 
And this was the start of the process to improve access in the United States to opioids for cancer patients. Charlie Cleland was also based in Wisconsin, and this is a study he did through the Eastern Cooperative Oncology Group. And this is actually the major cancer centers in the United States. And that what they found, despite many of the guidelines saying, let's treat cancer pain, at least 42% of people said that they were not were undertreated. And you are more likely to be undertreated if you were older. Um, from a minority population in FEMA. I remind you, our leading cancer centers in the United States in the 1990s. The WHO came up with the ladder, um, the three steps, it's really drifting more to a two-step ladder, non-opioids and opioids. And you can see here that even as we go forward in the early 80s, there was very little change in opioid consumption overall um, in these three high-income countries, United States in uh, uh, blue, uh, Germany in green, and Australia in gold. Um, we do see some increase coming up here in 1985. And some of this came from the introduction of sustained release morphine, that we start seeing the increase going forward. And we see a further increase starting to go up in the um, uh, late or 1990s, as Purdue Pharma actually reduced OxyContin at this stage. Um, an Institute of Medicine report said we need to be looking at pain control and came, even came out supporting the use of opioids for non-cancer um, um, situations that they may be useful, particularly intractable pain going forward, but said we really need to address pain. Pain as a fifth vital sign came out and this was a public relations thing. And many people say it was pharmaceutical companies. No, it was the Veterans Administration in the United States that did this, that was actually looking at the, the many military veterans who had served overseas and provides health care for them. They introduced pain as a fifth vital sign, not pharmaceutical companies. Yes, it was adopted by pharmaceutical companies. We actually have studies looking at state medical society's beliefs about pain addiction. And this is particularly true of the HIV community where many people with HIV had been uh, IV drug users. And the feeling at that time was that we should not be using opioids even as these patients died of um, uh, dis uh, disseminated HIV. Um, so many of the HIV patients as they died uh, before the uh, advent of that retrovirals were dying without appropriate pain relief. And it's because state licensing boards said it was not something we should be encouraging or doing. And this comes back to some of their attitudes and approaches. The diversion is a serious issue or problem in my state. Uh, are there policies available? Um, we have specific things here, but it was showing how that attitude and knowledge has changed going from the, uh, the checkered pattern, um, going forward to abuse is not a problem. Um, and as a physician for not, no one is physician for not treating pain. And now we actually see boards investigating people for not appropriately treating pain. But we can see here, as I mentioned, and state licensing boards are largely made up of physicians. So they are actually saying uh, and we already have a number of people who were saying cancer pain, only 50% of them actually thought, and it goes up to two thirds, that if you had cancer pain and a history of opioid dependency, you should not get opioids at the end of life. So that's where we were at. So these people were told and the belief of our state licensing boards was to allow these people to suffer because of their past sins in inverted commas. Um, we continue to hear these are life cho choices, but at the same time, we were actually told that this is a medical condition um, that people don't necessarily have control over in terms of all forms of addiction. And I think that's all dependency as I will now use the term. But in this perspective, we can now continue to see the opioid consumption in the high income countries going up. Um, the 
WHO put out this document, Achieving Balance in National Opioids Policies, to actually say this is something that we need to move forward with. And what does this really mean in terms of balance? National policy should establish a drug control system that prevents diversion and ensures. And the WHO included the language, drug control measures should not interfere with medical access to opioids. And I'm sure you can say and realize uh, for those of you who are in India, that that is not something that we can say is probably true in India at the present time. So I, you will often see this triangle with the um, policy at the bottom, but I've actually tipped this upside down. And why have I tipped this upside down? Because I actually think it's uh, important to realize that it's very hard to actually um, balance a triangle or a pyramid, um, a spinning top on its uh, top. A spinning top, you actually have to spin it to get it to stand up. But policy, medicine, availability, and education are the three things that we need to do to make sure that we're advancing in this situation. And I don't know, it doesn't. So here we have benefits and harms. Many of us in palliative care see the benefits over the harms. There are people who are on the other side who very much see um, all these other consequences and things from using opioids. And some of these are theoretical, um, some of them are very real, and it's important to be able to understand all these as we go forward. And I'll put the motor vehicle accidents, there are actually studies done which show that people who are on chronic opioids may actually be able to drive better than the same population who have chronic pain but is not appropriately managed. Does this apply to everyone in real world situations? Not necessarily. Hyperalgesia, yes, we talk about theoretically, this is the concept of increased pain due to the opioids. Theoretical consideration, I have not seen this very often clinically. Um, sleep disruption, opioids can cause sleep disruption, pain can probably cause even more. So it's important that we get a true concept of balance going forward. And this is from another, you, I'm quoting a lot of 19th century documents, it has been wittingly remarked for three falsehoods, fibs, downright lies, and the third and most aggravated is statistics. And it's probably how I've always felt about statistics, but I won't get into trouble for going that way. This is a report from the CDC, Prescription Painkiller Overdoses, that applies to the United States and our crisis here as we go forward. But if you actually look at this graph, it's quite significant because they actually say, hey, look at this, Both of, all of them are going up. Um, we can see opioid sales going up, opioid deaths going up, and opioid treatment emissions. And at the same time, the Institute of Medicine put out this report saying there's 100 million Americans with pain, chronic pain. They didn't say they all need opioids, but this is the contrast with the documents. But I point out this graph and let's look at it more closely. Is it truly what we want to be looking at? If we look at this, and what I've done now is convert the opioid deaths to 10,000, which is what the others are. Deaths, kilograms per 10, treatment emissions per 10,000, but they had opioid deaths per 100,000. And if you actually convert the opioid deaths to per 10,000, this is what the graph looks like. And it's nowhere near as significant a visual image, statistics the same, but the visual image is very different from this one. And it's also important to consider that the opioid related deaths, 60% of them are from polypharmacy. People who are taking benzodiazepines and alcohol together with the opioids that they're taking. And most people who are in these deaths have never been prescribed these medicines medically as well. They're obtaining them illicitly going forward. So statistics, you've got to understand them. And I actually played with this data a little bit. And if you actually put the opioid deaths per 10,000 here, divide opioid deaths per sale of uh, opioid sales, you actually see we have a flat line. Um, and in fact, per kilogram of opioid sold, there's been no change in the death rate. 
So you have to look very carefully at denominators, numerators, and understand the graphs and don't just look and take the first glance um, impression of the data. This is actually data again from the, uh, the FDA as they looked at approving a sustained release hydrocodone product. And what they said was, if you actually look at number of patient days of therapy, they actually said things were getting safer. As you can see from this trend downwards in terms of toxic exposure. So as much as people were saying, hey, these are very, very dangerous. Yes, the deaths have gone up. The toxicity has gone up in absolute numbers, but we're now prescribing more. And in fact, the FDA said this is actually going down the toxicities related to these products. Again, very different from the message we were hearing. If we look at, and people will use data in many, many ways, percentage of the population with chronic pain and how opioids are used. So there are real differences in countries. And I still don't think we understand why the US has ended up in this situation. I would say most of it is not being chronic pain. A lot of it has actually been acute pain and the way we've given uh, tablets for acute pain. And we're gonna talk about some of that I had my wisdom teeth removed and was given 30, um, let me get my number, 30, three, zero, five milligram tablets of oxycodone to use postoperatively. That is probably unheard of in most places in India and around the world. But doctor prescribed painkillers are probably not the greatest threat. And this is an article that came out in the popular lay press saying that we need to look carefully at this. Here is a study that is saying that uh, there may be increased fractures associated with the use of opioids and falls, and that has been often quoted. So again, look at the data as we study forward. Older patients with uh, studies uh, with opioids may have more falls, and this is in the first two weeks um, associated risk. But if we actually look at the data, most of the people they studied were on propoxifen, an opioid that we don't actually recommend because of the risk of falls in the elderly. So again, look carefully at the data as you go forward, because then you can actually have an appropriate balance situation. We do not use propoxifen, although it is very, was very commonly used in the United States. We can now look here at the uh, consumption in the United States and we're getting up close to 500 milligrams, 600 milligrams per person. You can see Australia um, here, Germany jumped a little and it changes a little as we go forward. But here we've got other countries such as Kenya, almost none and India, I can tell you is one of these large bubbles uh, down here together with China, having almost no opioid consumption at that stage. But the DEA actually knew in the United States, every time the pharmaceutical industry requested opioids, that request goes to the DEA who just submits it to Vienna. So the US government, the DEA was saying the United States needs more opioids. So it's important that this is a multi-layered process that we need to understand as we go forward. There are many people who talk about this being a social uh, An economic determinants the, in the opiate crisis in the United States, we need to look very carefully at how we, what is underlying this and the, the issues of poverty that may be very significantly going forward. And we have to look at the original root causes and in some of the areas where there's been very, very high um, consumption of heroin and heroin deaths. It's actually been areas high, areas of high unemployment and loss of uh, meaningful uh, uh, workforce and uh, future opportunities uh, around the United States, what we call the Rust Belt now in the Midwest. But here's some data from surgical pain. And I like this study because it actually involves patients. They looked at a number of patients at Yale who were getting different procedures and they were breast cancer patients, uh, cholecystectomy patients, and inguinal hernia replacements, uh, inguinal hernia repair replacements, and they looked at their opioid consumption. And you can see the number of different um, opioids that were, uh, or cases, I don't like the word cases, but the number of uh, operations performed. And then we can actually look at the 
the opioids that were actually consumed. So here, for instance, is the mastectomy patients. And what you can see is here um, is the number of pills prescribed to these patients and then the number of pills actually taken by these patients. So the average number of 300,000 operations of these in the United States a year, partial mastectomy patients, so the equivalent of a lumpectomy, and we can see that most of the patients got between uh, five to 30 tablets, but 75% of them consume no opioids. If you went on to have a partial mastectomy and lymph node dissection, we can see that that number of tablets was actually higher. Um, still 30 was a general sort of number. And we can see that patients took more, but in general, very few patients took more than 10 tablets. So maybe that's what we should be giving patients rather than giving them 30 tablets with another 20 or so sitting around. We once were in a meeting in Madison, Wisconsin, where the question came up, what is the right number of tablets for me to prescribe for a 55-year-old man having his wisdom tooth removed? And the 20 people in the room couldn't get a good answer. And one of my colleagues very rightfully said, it's probably enough so that I or my colleagues don't get called after hours for a refill. So this had really nothing to do with appropriate pain control. It was how do we look after physicians as we go forward in terms of uh, health care. Um, I will repeat this study here. This is the inguinal repair. And you can see that the laparoscopic patients got lots of uh, pain medicines. Um, how much did they use? Not that much. If you had an open inguinal repair, we can see almost 50% got close to 30 tablets. And again, their consumption, almost no one consumed those 30 tablets. But why are we giving all these tablets going forward? And that's a significant issue. Uh, we now have systems where we have take backs in different locations. A number of places in uh, Wisconsin and Indiana, where I now live, have drop box at police stations where you can actually drop off your opioids and other tablets into a locked box to make sure that they're disposed of properly and not available to uh, misuse. We now have prescription monitoring programs. I cannot write for an opioid in, uh, and I write all my scripts electronically now. I cannot write for an opioid without checking in the prescription monitoring program, which the state monitors where patients got them and pharmacies log all this and it's available for us to search and it's linked with our electronic medical records. And we can show that that's a good process. But I think that is a very challenging process for us to think of every country, low and middle income country being able to do moving forward. But particularly with the use of cell phone technology, it may actually be something very significant for us to uh, investigate. Um, I do use the example that something like 90% of Kenyan banking is now done on cell phones. But having been in India during the financial crisis, I think it was 2016, where my wife and I could not even get enough money to buy a train ticket back from Amritsar, Aritz uh, it was quite a terrifying situation to understand when uh, all the banks and the, the, the money machines suddenly stopped functioning. Um, we did have some friends lend us some money at the time to actually be able to do that. But we've got to be able to have systems that we can continue using as we go forward. Um, here is another use of data, and this is from a CDC page, and you can see that opioid deaths are going up. What most people don't notice, and this is a, up in the corner here, Methadone contributed to one in three of prescription painkiller deaths in the United States. It certainly didn't represent one third of the opioids prescribed, but it was one third of the deaths. And this is a, an article from the Seattle Times. And what it's doing is actually looking at the, uh, the morphine consumption, what was being prescribed. You can see methadone in orange, a little bit of fentanyl in the dark blue, um, uh, we've got oxycodone, predominant, you know, some there, uh, morphine. But here is the deaths. 
And people are saying, what is happening? Why is this the case as we go forward? And it actually is, if you look at this data, um, and the Seattle Times plotted this out, it turns out in Washington, and this is uh, the city of Washington, uh, oh, sorry, city of Seattle in Washington, they actually geocoded where these opioid deaths supposedly took place. And many of them were poor areas of Seattle. And what the state had actually done was saying people who are on government assistance schemes will not use expensive opioids. They will use methadone um, after morphine. And so many physicians were forced to prescribe methadone, even though they didn't know how to use it or prescribe it. So we saw, and this is, there were 14 states that did this for their poorer patients. So we saw methadone contributing one third of the deaths. We rarely hear this from um, people who are saying that the opioid had this horrible crisis. Um, and these are the states where we actually saw significant uh, process going forward with the percentage of deaths associated with uh, methadone. Um, and so very, very significant to look at. And here is again some more data, death rate caused by prescription medicine, single prescription medicine, uh, methadone was much, much higher based on the pharmacology of what we know about it. Here we have, and I don't know, I know I'm talking to an Indian audience uh, largely now, but this was an article I pulled out and it was not based on uh, the nature of Indian American doctors. It was just one example. Um, and here, and it's horrible that the headline says this, um, but in actual fact, and I think I actually got this off an Indian website, if you tell it's got Indian standard time, um, but here is someone who was actually prescribing opioids, what I would say illicitly and illegitimately. You can actually see the number of scripts. And I think I have the math here blowing up a day. This would amount to 423 prescriptions a day if he worked five days a week. I can't do that. And I'm meant to be a fairly good opioid prescriber. Um, I hate to think of... Uh, what was going on here, um, absolutely incredible. Um, this is not medicine, I, as I would call it. This is actually uh, criminal activity and has to be highlighted as such going forward uh, as we look at this. Um, there's also, we hear, yes, there's not just the, uh, the deaths. There are other reasons, um, abuse dependence, non-medical users. What do we even mean by a non-medical user? Uh, a misuse is, in fact, in any way that a doctor did not direct you to use them. So when I speak to medical audiences, I ask the question, how many of you have misused an opioid? And no one puts up their hand. I put up mine, and they, then I explain what misuse is. Use without a prescription of the respondent's own, use in greater amounts. So if a physician says you to take one tablet every four hours and you take one and a half or two tablets, that's misuse. Or if you use them in another way, do not take with alcohol and you take them with alcohol. When I had my wisdom teeth removed, I did not fill my prescription of 30 oxycodone tablets. We had some oxycodone in the cupboard that had been prescribed for my daughter. And I used four of them in the next three days. That is officially misuse. So understanding what misuse is, is important as we go through with data. So most people in the United States have actually, here we look at it, main reasons for misuse, people are using it to relieve physical pain. Uh, it may be your wife's tablets. It may be your uh, a child's tablet that you're actually saying, hey, these are in the cupboard. And it's interesting that most physicians like having Opioids that are prescribed for, for if I get severe pain. Um, and so we've got these reasons, but pain, the physical things, is actually what people are primarily taking um, previously controlled medicines for. This is a little difficult to see, and I'll try and blow this up for you, but it's a study done in JAMA, and it is actually looking at where most patients actually get these medicines from. So here it is blown up. So the number of days used is across here or misused, non-medical use. And where did you get them from? So if you were having a limited number of days, 60% got these from a friend or free. 
It was those people who were actually using them from longer who were stealing, buying, or buying from a drug dealer. We can see that here, down at the less than uh, 1 to 29 days, most of these people are not buying them at all, but it's when people are getting into this chronic use that they're going and buying. Again, important to understand the statistics behind it. Um, here we go, and we can actually look at the, again, the non-medical use. I had a physician friend tell me saying, you know, Dr. Cleary, I was actually a little like you and being quite liberal um, until I realized that the high school quarterback, quarterback, the lead position in the American football team, was sharing the pain tablets, the opioids I was prescribing for him with the rest of the team. And my question to him was, why were you prescribing opioids to the high school quarterback? And he said, well, he had to play on Friday night. And I'm saying, that's just tell him to rest and stop playing football, but don't give him opioids to play football on a Friday night. No wonder it was probably like a candy shop for these people to say, hey, get hurt on a Friday night and continue playing because we've got a friendly physician who's giving us opioids going forward. But these numbers are actually decreasing now. We're seeing less people using opioids going forward. And some of this may actually be the uh, a situation with heroin. There's some interesting and in how we look at data becomes quite, we have to be very careful again, how we look at data. This is um, data looking at the different cities, uh, their rate of uh, misuse and some higher, you can see the West Coast quite high. Uh, this next graph you can focus in and here's Indiana in here. Um, we've got all this for all the counties in Wisconsin in the United States now. But interestingly, as we go forward, and I ask you to look at these different graphs, we can actually now also look at these graphs. And this is a study that was actually done in published, which shows opioid consumption with the, compared to the counties that voted for Donald Trump in 2016. And people found an association. Association does not mean causality. And we can find associations for all sorts of things going forward um, that don't necessarily mean that they're linked at all. It's purely an association. But there's been this band of states, and as I called it, the Rust Belt, has been very significant for opioid consumption and misuse and deaths going forward. But if we look at the different states, the deaths and prescriptions there's actually been no linkage between the number of prescriptions provided and the deaths per 100,000. Very little, and even these are the opioid-related ER visits. We've got a, I would say, flat line there, it's slightly negative, no consistent trends. And here's an example of a state, and this is the state of Florida, and I think it is significant. Um, what they did, and I'll blow up that letter for you, they actually shut down 500 pill mills and they had 98 of the top 100 hydrocodone prescribers. And they had a third of the world, uh, sorry, the United States is, um, uh, sorry, they had a decline in deaths by 65% um, and overall prescription drug deaths declined 30%. And a lot of this came about because they shut down a law that allowed physicians to dispense opioids. So not, not only could physicians write the scripts, they could dispense them. And that's why Florida had pill mills. You go in, pay you hundred dollars. Um, the physician sees you in two minutes and then gives you 30 uh, oxycodone tablets and you leave. And that's why Florida became the hotbed for pill mills all around the place. And this law change effectively shut this down. But we've also had significant issues going forward with um, uh, guidelines. This is the 2016 CDC guideline, which actually said, uh, we're going to crack down now on all these opioid deaths based on all this data. Um, we're going to do this. Look at this thing down here though, and I think my next slide actually says that, or we, we come back to it. Um, not intended for patients, active cancer treatment, palliative care or end of life. 
But here's what they then said. Use immediate release oxycodone. Opioids when starting don't have a problem. Lowest effective dose don't have a problem. This implication that the morphine milligram equivalence is, results in higher toxicity is questionable because it's much of the studies were based on the use of methadone, which we've already shown has problems associated and prescribe short durations of acute, for acute pain. And I don't have a problems with this. Three days or less will often be sufficient. More than seven days will rarely be needed. That's very true if you're having an ingrown toenail or wisdom teeth removed. But if you're having a Whipple's procedure with removal of your pancreas and your liver, telling me that I'm only going to need three to seven days of opioid pain relief um, is not something that I really want to know. That's not true. This comes back to these opioid trends and the use of methadone. And this is where the setting of these levels came up. 32 deaths were analyzed from this data in Washington state as being opioid caused. 15 were from oxycodone, 22 from methadone. And yet they came out and said that we need to be careful when prescribing opioids and there's this ceiling dose, but a lot of it had to do with the way the methadone were prescribed. And this is another similar study looking at these patients um, and coming up with similar conclusions as we went forward. So we, here's the methadone surge and things changed with methadone around, um, uh, yes, I've got that right. I've got to follow my curves. Here's the methadone surge here um, as we go forward. This one here is we can actually see, and I've got a, this is cocaine related deaths uh, going forward. There was a peak there. And then we also have here coming in blue synthetic opioids and we have heroin surges. And people say with well, heroin was because people started cracking down on opioids, prescribed opioids. But if we actually look at this um, and we can question this data, and this is looking at data showing the different age groups and who was using these, young people, not even prescribed pain medicines, but they're actually beginning to have overdose. Um, we can see here and the older folks down the bottom, not much, um, but it was younger people who were impacted. And these people are rarely prescribed opioids whatsoever. And people say, well, non-medical use of opioids was because we started shutting down. And what this study did was actually show that the surge in heroin actually was well before the opioid prescription started being impacted. And I think that's a very significant to know. The key factor for use of heroin in the United States is the cost of heroin. Um, so we saw this happening because heroin became very, very cheap and it was coming in from Mexico um, and rather than from Asia at the time. And it was the start of the cartels in Mexico that really saw the price of heroin come down. And then the, uh, the uh, uh, change and then we saw other evidence, and this is from New England, uh, which showed that heroin, because of the change in cost, was actually becoming the opioid of first use rather than prescribed medicines. And this is back in 13 and 14. And it wasn't just that because of the CDC guidelines. And you can see that starting to go up as the price of heroin came down. Um, we can look at these other things and we can see the methadone peaked and that was a change that was good to see. I still use methadone, but use it carefully going forward. We now have some states in the United States where in actual fact, the percentage of opioid deaths have nothing to do with prescribed opioids. It's actually due to illicit fentanyl that's coming in from overseas, from Mexico and from uh, China. Uh, that it's really quite incredible. So you can see here, Massachusetts, fentanyl and fentanyl analogs, New Hampshire up there, 100% of it coming from fentanyl and fentanyl analogs. Prince, the music performer, actually died of a fentanyl overdose, although he was never prescribed fentanyl. He thought he was taking a hydrocodone tablet. It was actually an illegal hydrocodone or a fraudulent one, fake one, and it contained fentanyl, and he died of the overdose. I recently had a physician colleague tell me that he had a young intern who wanted to go into medicine, who actually, uh, this was a college student, 
who died of a fentanyl overdose. He went to a party and was offered a tablet and took this tablet not knowing that it contained fentanyl and he died. To which my response was, I've never gone to a party in my life and taken a tablet that I didn't know what it contained. Um, so yes, we all have our vices, but it's important to understand what is really going on in this situation. And we can see here again, data from the United States that illicit fentanyl is contributing to far more of the deaths at the United States now than anything to do with prescribed opioids. Significant factors, and we can even take out these, uh, analyze these graphs better, uh, all prescription opioids without illicit fentanyl, and then the illicit fentanyl represents that tip there. Um, methadone has been important. I'll skip this slide. Um, but they're coming in from China. Um, we can see this. Here's car fentanyl as well, which is even a thousand times more potent than um, uh, more fentanyl in itself. Um, so 100 times more potent than fentanyl, very, very potent. And this is the sort of drug you use when you need to tranquilize an elephant, um, which is not something that most people have to commonly do. One of the reasons a lot of this can slip through customs and immigration, if you think how much fentanyl powder or uh, car fentanyl you can get into an envelope, the US Postal Service only x-rays envelopes that are way less than um, uh, 60 milligrams, but you can get a lot of car fentanyl in an envelope that's less than 60 milligrams. So as we look at all these going forward and the number of deaths, um, multi-pharmacy is clearly still very, very important as we go forward, but prescription opioids down here much, much less likely cause of death going forward. So we have this pain crisis and we'll finish off by coming back to the global. Um, here's the CDC guideline. It's not intended for cancer patients. Um, here we have actually a letter from a pharmacist with chronic pain to the uh, CDC and we have a reply. Uh, this is a, the reply to this pharmacist the guideline is a set of voluntary uh, situations. The CDC encourage physicians to continue to use their clinical judgment and base their treatment on what they know. It is the ultimate goal of the guideline to ensure people who need them have access to opioids while reducing opioid deaths. And they have actually just recently re-released them and uh, reviewing some of the impact of this. They've created in this situation though pill limits. I have insurance companies and others who tell me, no, this patient can only get 30 tablets a month. And I say they have cancer and it's complicating out my ability to provide appropriate care. We can look at the different countries in terms of their opioid prescribing, defined daily doses and the overdoses, no correlation whatsoever in those linkages um, going forward. So this business that it's unsafe to prescribe opioids we now also have situations in the United States, and it's also compacted by COVID, but this was from Sloan Kettering, where they were actually giving an email out saying, we are short of IV opioids in the United States. Please look and avoid giving different opioids. And these messages even come around my own hospital in Indiana now saying we are short of opioids. Um, at the same time, we come back to this situation. It is really critical that we not only uh, improve access into these low and middle income countries, but we also don't let this bloatedness in other places around the world impact our ability to provide what I consider is a human right to most people in the rest of the world. Um, if we actually look at low and um, immediate release morphine, we may be able to do this as we said in the Lancet Commission without a huge investment in dollars to actually get immediate release morphine around the system, around the world. But we need good systems in place to make this happen. And here's an example from India. Here in the rural outskirts of Kolkata, that number more than half died three months later. Arturo died three months later, not from the gun, but from his disease. But real issues are related to this and recently wrote an, uh, a paper on uh, the Robin Hood of uh, 
uh, cancer pay in a man who was actually diverting opioids from other patients who did no longer needed them to make sure R2 got appropriate pain control. It's not something I would do um, and risk my license, but here was someone who was actually doing this to make sure R2 got appropriate pain control. Um, we're not going forward for some reason. There we go. Suicide has been common in many other countries, um, particularly the Soviet Union. We'd say the high ranking admirals and military. And because of this, uh, prior to the war in the Ukraine, the Russian government was actually making changes to the way they provided palliative care going forward. But it's very important that we take the work of ourselves, um, originally in Wisconsin, now in Indiana, the work of the Lancet Commission and move forward to bring about this change and to establish balance as we go forward. I urge caution as do others in association with industry. And this is um, an editorial from the, or an article from the LA Times saying, be careful with working with industry. They may have contributed to the problem in the US and I think they did but we can't actually, like tobacco, allow them to take over. And it may actually be working with morphine can prevent this problem. Um, there's not much money in morphine, but we need balance. Medicine, education, um, need policies to change so that we can provide good palliative care. And I leave you with this notion of balance, and this is a video worth keeping going. Balance is a very, very key issue. It may be something we think we can achieve, but even in our process to achieve it, things may become undone. And this may represent the US situation as we work to achieve balance going forward. But it's important that we don't lose our insight to actually achieve balance. I'll stop there and be very willing to have discussion and questions as we go forward. Thank you, uh, Jim. Uh... So now I would uh, I like you to ask uh, your doubts. So what is the reason for the methadone deaths uh, in US? Is it a cardiovascular complication or anything else? Sorry, what is the... What is the uh, cause of the methadone, increased methadone deaths in, in the US? Uh, is it the, more of the cardiovascular complications or was it uh, any other reason? Respiratory depression. People don't know how to prescribe it. So as much as we talk about methadone and QTC interval changes and we medicalize that, if you suddenly give someone 10 milligrams of methadone three times a day, and I'll remind you that at one stage, the recommendation, it was the example we did, the guidelines for acute pain actually suggested it was a one to two conversion one to three conversions. So we were sometimes converting people from 100 milligrams of morphine to 30 milligrams of methadone a day. And if you did that, you actually drove depressed respiration very, very quickly. So most of those methadone deaths had nothing to do with QC interval changes. I've actually, I don't think I've seen a clinical implication of QTC prolongation when I've used methadone. I've measured it and seen it, but I've never had anyone complain of arrhythmias or present to the emergency room with uh, torsade. Okay, so thank you. Other comments, questions? Is this ring true? People, people's experience, what are you hearing about our horrible situation in the United States? Is it impacting the way you practice healthcare? Looks like someone's dancing there, maybe rocking a baby. Anybody else? So in the use of uh, opioids in general, should we start always with, uh, uh, you know, or morphine and then convert it to see other uh, drugs? Is it safer that way? Or do you, do you recommend starting with say fentanyl or more methadone, but in the right doses? So the challenge with fentanyl is, and I'll put it out there, that really most of us in the world only have fentanyl patches. So in fact, we have to start with the patch. If we go back to the original guidelines on the patch, it was start with immediate release opioids, 
oral opioids, and then titrate and switch to uh, um, fentanyl. It's interesting in the United States that the, um, the FDA has defined tolerance for the purposes of using fentanyl products as being above 60 milligrams of immediate release morphine a day. There are some situations where I will start people on a 12 microgram per hour patch if they're taking the equivalent of 30 milligrams of morphine a day. Um, but I actually like to see people up to the at least 30 milligrams of opioid equivalent before, before I start the fentanyl. Um, the problem with the fentanyl patch is it takes, uh, you know, the 12 to 18 hours to actually kick in. And if you put a patch on and actually see the toxicity at 24 hours, most of the fentanyl that you worry about is already in the body. It's been absorbed and is sitting there in a depot and you've really got to work to counteract it. And I've seen situations where people have come in with too many fentanyl patches on. Um, this was an example that went to Congress in the United States, a young man who got his wisdom teeth removed and the dentist actually prescribed him a 50 microgram per hour fentanyl patch together with immediate release oxycodone. So he was taking the immediate release oxycodone because the fentanyl didn't kick in. So he's got this and then the fentanyl kicked in. And when he finally got to the emergency room, not breathing, they gave him one dose of um, uh, Narcan and said, it should be right. This guy needs to be on a Narcan in a naloxone infusion to counteract the impact. Naloxone has a very, very short half-life. So we need to understand the pharmacology of that as well. And that just giving, and I've said it happened with morphine, uh, methadone, people who've taken methadone, it's in the system for a long time. And what do they do? Get a single injection of Narcan and, oh, he must be really addicted because he um, uh, became drowsy again 10 minutes later. You don't understand the pharmacology of the product you're using. You each need to run a naloxone infusion to actually do this. I never thought I liked pharmacology as a medical student, and part of it was it was all too theoretical. I think that there are also, and I actually do really enjoy the pharmacology of this because you see the real implications. And if you understand the pharmacology of these products, it makes such a, a difference to patients. Um, sir, uh, if we restrict uh, opioid use in non-cancer patients, uh, will it, is it wise to do that? Like we will not land up in US-like situation in India? Um, so that's a very, should we restrict it? So then you have to start saying, well, what is um, you know, cancer? We get into challenging problems with what about people who are post therapy from cancer and don't have active cancer? So I use a lot of um, uh, opioids for my the chronic head and neck cancer patients who have considerable pain. Um, you, you only have to look at patients who've had surgery and radiotherapy to their head and neck and say, wow, that's probably got to hurt. They've got this board in their neck and they can hardly bend it. So I use it in those patients. Then I start saying, I've got a lady with um, horrible COPD. We use some opioids for her dyspnea and it works well for that. But she has collapsed vertebrae from the osteoporosis um, and aging. And she's got kidney impairment. We struggle with non-steroidals. Should I be using opioids for that? And it's interesting, and I always love it when an orthopedic doctor comes back and says, there's not much I can do for this. I really think you need to be on opioids. And I say, thank goodness for this orthopedic doctor. Um, but you don't often hear that. But many people have intractable pain that we don't have good alternatives for. Um, I'm, I will come back and say I'm a little, and it's a part of this, I worry if we create the language of pain-free hospitals. Um, the target is not necessarily freedom from pain. It's actually to reduce pain. And if we look at Charlie Cleland's data, and it was done with Ron Serlin as well in the early 1990s, he showed in multiple cultures, countries, that in fact, if you can get someone's pain level to a four or less, so they term that mild pain. 
pain has much less impact on people's quality of life than it does at five to six moderate pain or seven and above severe pain. So I identify with patients that our goal is to get pain down into that four, two, three, four region. And most of you have no idea what my pain score is at the moment. Um, it's not too bad. My knee plays up occasionally, but it's a three. My shoulder plays up and it's a two. I function with that. And most of us, as we age, and I'm looking at there's some youngsters who are saying, what are you talking about, chronic pain like that? But there's this, those of us who are aging are living with this chronic pain most of our time, and we continue to function pretty well with it. So I put the target as four or below and I work with that with patients rather than saying zero pain is the target. So uh, like we should be actively working for tapering and uh, stopping the opioids as soon as we get the targets less than five? Uh, so I'm getting to a target of less than five with opioids in many cases. So I'm not stopping opioids for people with chronic pain. And I don't think we have the evidence to say we shouldn't be using that. If you actually look at the data still, um, the Australian data is very interesting. So Australia has had interesting problems with um, uh, opioid dependency, but that is because they had a codeine product that was available over the counter. So in Australia, you could get a, uh, a panadine, which was eight milligrams of codeine together with Tylenol, acetaminophen, uh, paracetamol, or um, non-steroidals. So people were becoming dependent on that codeine and actually getting into problems with uh, Tylenol overdoses and liver disease and chronic kidney disease because of all the non-steroidals they were taking. There was actually no problems at all with the codeine other than some constipation. So they have banned that product in Australia now. So you need a prescription to get codeine and they've removed that. But the problem that the dependency problem that they had was people were, take, were dying and getting sick from all the other medicines that were actually in there. And that's a real risk with non-steroidals and with um, a paracetamol going forward, the toxicity. And I remind you that the levels for uh, appropriate daily use of uh, paracetamol have dropped progressively since I was a boy. Um, you know, we were never that concerned with uh, except acute overdoses. There was never any language when I was in medical school that chronic Tylenol was a bad problem. I say that uh, there was clearly some evidence with kidney disease and um, the combination of caffeine, um, and I'm blanking on the other medicines at the time, with the uh, kidney uh, impairment and kidney stones. And that'll come back to me soon. But as I age, my memory's going. So, so it's good that uh, these opioids do not come in fixed drug combinations with uh, NSAIDs and uh, Tylenol, like paracetamol. In I India, actually we prefer straight opioids, yeah. Uh, so it's in one way good that we have very limited number of opioids available in India. We have only morphine, methadone, and codeine, uh, and maybe dextropropoxifene in some cough syrups, I think. Sunil sir might enlighten more, but we have very limited number of drugs only in India. So do you think from your perspective, this is good enough for us to handle or should we, should our tool, toolkit be bigger than this? Um, you know, this is a challenge for those of us who develop expertise in palliative care. We always want a bigger toolkit. And if you look at this example, and I like being able to actually rotate opioids, and methadone may not always be the right choice, and having uh, another product, having a patch is actually a good option that we have, particularly for head and neck cancer patients when swallowing doesn't becomes an issue. Yes, we can go into subcutaneous and we can run infusions. That becomes very difficult in rural communities. Um, and you know, India, a huge percentage of the population is in rural, rural communities. Can we get syringe drivers and things out there? Are we even going to get fentanyl patches out into the community in those situations? Um, but that's why I like having different medications. 
Um, I don't have a problem in saying, well, we're going to actually restrict the physicians who can prescribe these extra products. And maybe it's not primary care physicians or everyone uh, under the sun. It's certainly, and we've seen them used in post-operative pain, but they shouldn't be used in post-operative pain as I've given examples. So maybe surgeons shouldn't be allowed to, but maybe it's palliative care physicians and people who have training such as this, who then have the ability to actually prescribe them. But I'll come back, what if you've seen someone in consultation, they go back to their primary care physician, can they? So there are uh, things, and I think we can set up appropriate government processes that allow access to these without them being restrictive. But you've got to have the person power to provide the palliative care and have the number of physicians to do this. And there is even a big push around the world to make sure that primary palliative care is more available. So more physicians are actually allowed to practice primary palliative care rather than all being in the hands of specialists and uh, subspecialists going forward. So we can't cookie cutter and say every, um, every country should have the same regulations. It's even difficult in a country like India, and I'm going to guess now how many uh, states you have. I think it's 36 now, isn't it? It changes a little bit as people divide and I can't keep up with the number of states. Um, but the states all have different regulations. And this has actually been a, um, a policy with states. The federal government has come back with some control over opioids. Um, but this is an ongoing challenge, and it's even interpreted by different states. And that's why Kerala has been such an exception that the government in Kerala has actually been supportive of these initiatives going forward. How many states are there now? Kerala State Stepping. Hmm? 37? I After think it's 27 or 8. 28. 20. Yeah, 28. I just 28. asked my 10 year, 10 year old son the update. In this. <laughs> <laughs> I just turned back and asked my son, how many states are there in our country? And nothing wrong, Dr. Punita, because uh, the number of our states keep changing day by day, I think. <laughs> and I know people talk, I spent some time in Bihar um, as well as uh, in West Bengal, and Bihar was one state in 1983. Now it's two states. Other questions? So is there any advantage in nerve blocks when it comes to intractable pain more than uh, opioids? Or we just need to step up the dosage because there's no ceiling? Uh, there's advantages both, uh, some work. But the, the, question, the problem I have with the nerve block stuff is that you'll actually see people who are saying, well, that didn't work, let me do it again. And you see people have in this increasing evidence that doing surgery on spinal, uh, on um, vertebral surgery, disc surgery, probably not beneficial. Um, it's interesting, the norms we have accepted for surgical operations. We now have surgical evidence that doing a meniscal repair for most menisci, unless you have a bucket handle which restricts movement, physical therapy is as good as surgical manipulation of a menisci in the knee. But what was our norm? We just said menisci and we allowed surgeons to do this stuff for years and years and years, make fortunes, put me through, I've had three, um, yeah, and the evidence is that physical therapy would be just as good. but our, And that's true with many of these blocks, that we may get as much advantage from uh, the opiates, but we need to be doing the appropriate evidence to get it rather than just saying, well, we've been doing these surgical interventions for years. They work for some. We'll keep trying them. The evidence is that many of the blocks, I get the best time to do a celiac plexus block for someone with pancreatic cancer is when the celiac plexus is in the hands of the surgeon. And you can say, wow, well, that's actually true. That's the best time for a celiac plexus, the least risk. And I've actually talked to my block jockeys, as I call them. And when you actually find out what they do, they actually get a very thin needle and pop it through the aorta. And I say, you're going to pop a very thin needle through my aorta to get to my celiac plexus? No, thank you. But that's how they do a, a posterior approach, the plexus block. Um, 
But the best time to do that is when you actually have the surgeon in there. And if you know someone's got and they're doing the surgery, see that this person has intractable or irresectable pancreatic cancer. Doing a celiac plexus block can help with pain control greatly then or having the people who can do it under appropriate uh, a CT control to make sure it gets in the right spot rather than relying on fluoroscopy. But I'm, I'm not against blocks. They've got to be used diligently and not as the only answer and often concurrently with opioids. And I heard this from the uh, one of the leaders of the International Atomic Energy Agency. They're responsible for radiation therapy. And they're saying as much as we're trying to build radiation therapy, um, Radiation therapy will not take over from the pain control of opioids. We need both. And I would say that's probably true of blocks, radiation therapy for uh, treating cancer pain and opioids, as well as other and uh, co-analgesics. They're all part of the armamentarium that we need going forward. Yes, yeah, so this is true because I, I had problems with patients who had advanced uh, pancreatic cancer were not controlled with uh, high dose of morphine and so on. Uh, there was no other way other than to refer them to the surgeon for the celiac plexus box, but they did not have relief even with those procedures. And so they used to come back. And so that was a harrowing experience for us also how to control that. But then again, uh, there was one patient who was very challenging where we started on methadone after morphine was not working in very high doses. But then he found out his own way of controlling the pain by high uh, having uh, taking morphine and um, uh, methadone and at the same time, taking morphine for, uh, you know, breakthrough pain. So he was combining both, though I said that this was not that advisor, but he said, no, it's, it's actually controlling the pain. And that's how he's controlling his pain. Uh, so, uh, Jim, uh, I'm just trying to ask you, uh, you were working mostly on opioids. That's what I understand. So how did yeah. you uh, got interested uh, in getting working with the opioids that's one question and another question is uh, um uh, which opioid you have used uh, in your uh, pain management and you uh, used uh, brompton cocktail and uh, many other things so is there an order in which you have used uh, these opioids so i'm still a great believer in morphine i think it is the medicine we should be using and as much as i um and particularly as I teach this, as we work around the world, I think I should practice what I teach as well. So it shouldn't be one is good for the goose, should be good for the gander, so to speak. But we, I can say this is my experience. We do have a lot of immediate release oxycodone in the United States used by many physicians. So patients come to me on that and converting to a sustained release oxycodone can actually be a little easier than going back to morphine. There's stigma associated with morphine, but I don't have a problem using, and I try to use morphine as the first line opioid to start with. How did I get involved in opioids? I actually, so I trained in medical oncology, and I thought I wanted to be a cytotoxic pharmacologist doing phase one studies and all this stuff. And I thought that might be exciting as much as I didn't really like pharmacology. I was trying to find a use for pharmacology. And so I went into the lab, but the lab in Adelaide, Australia, did not actually have cytotoxic pharmacology. They were doing some opioid pharmacology. So I started there. Um, when I went to the United States in 1994, we did both some opioid pharmacology and cytotoxic. I did some phase one studies and quickly tired of that and said, this is not what I want to do. Um, and they asked me to start the palliative care program there in 1996, which is what I did. And that's why we stayed. The cricket is not very good in uh, the United States, but getting better. But fortunately, I can't comment on cricket at the moment. We did badly. Australia did badly. But I can say, and I'll just finish off to say that I did actually see Tendulkar in his first tour of Australia in 1993, I think, or two. One of the, 1993, I think, was his first tour of uh, Australia. So I've actually been able to, to say I've uh, followed the career of a great man. Peru, you have a question? Uh, yes, yeah, sir. Thank you so much for this excellent session. Um, what I wanted to ask is like, please enlighten me for this. Uh, because of the opioid epidemic in the US, there was like, there is uh, subsequently 
opioid phobia and quite of restrictions in india what has been done in the us to mitigate this uh, opioid epidemic if you could please enlighten were there any restrictions or they are finding the alternatives to the opioids no the people are suffering so this is why the cdc guidelines have been rewritten but still the implications are great there's a lot of push we're trying to change some of this language but even as we uh, i get we were talking at a session on the global problem and even a physician from the united states raised the issue of saying you don't want to recreate be very careful look what that these nasty palliative care people did in the united states um, and that's why i show you the data so you can actually say let's undo this data and this is not the situation. One of the real problems that we have in the United States is, is a re, in a reaction to the opioid crisis, many of these changes were legislated, meaning that the state governments changed the rules. In order to undo them, the state legislature has to undo the rules. This is opposed to changing regulations where someone in government departments as come on india is the home of regulations um you know that you have more regulators in the civil service and things but it doesn't go to the parliament you can change regulations but it's much tougher to change the rules and the laws as they're written and that's one of the problems and concerns i have in the states because many of these have been legislated, it will actually be very hard for us to bring about these changes. The AMA is working very, very hard to actually, the American Medical Association to address some of these. Um, it's gonna be a continual process to get these things changed. I wish I had a straightforward answer, but we're back almost, we're further back than we were in the 90s because of some of the reaction to this uh, last epidemic. Okay, so thank you so much. Someone's uh, made the comment questions about uh, uh, stigma. Yes, there is a stigma with morphine. And that's one of the problems that we also face in the United States from both physicians and patients. Oh, am I that sick? I must be close to death if you're actually talking morphine. And I try to point out the fact that if you look at it historically, um, and it's one of the things that the people that will say that, you know, morphine is basically doctors prescribing heroin and i say duh they're all just opioids um you know it's interesting the connotations that we have with the different ones heroin is morphine with two acetyl molecules on it it's more soluble and that's why england uses it in syringe drivers because it's much more soluble and can mix with other products so there's some pharmacology behind that that makes it very useful um oxycodone almost the same as morphine it's got three changes in the rings um these are all opioids and we need to find appropriate way it's fascinating as we promote the use of patches like buprenorphine patches methadone for opioid withdrawal opioid dependence syndrome how do we increase access to this opioids while at the same time we're trying to restrict opioids for pain patients it's a totally unbalanced situation, and I encourage people not to use the United States as an example. There are far more very good models in the in the Europe and the United Kingdom, which is no longer part of Europe, um, that we need to consider as we go forward. So, Jim, uh, why did the doctors in the United States uh, prescribe? Uh, opioids, uh, even for tooth extraction? Is it because of the influence of uh, insurance companies or uh, something else? Sorry, why did they use morphine instead of? No, no. Uh, uh, I heard here that uh, even for tooth extraction, the doctors prescribed opioids uh, in US. Um, so why, uh, why, why, uh, why is that practice? Is it because of the influence of insurance companies or something else? Insurance companies are actually working more to restrict opioids now, and that's a real problem. In the in previous, it was probably a large part to do with pharmaceutical companies marketing products. And we have far more marketing for all products in the United States. Um, it's the business of um, 
industry, and I suspect some of my um, retirement benefits are caught up in uh, pharmaceutical companies and the profits of sharp pharma. I will probably retire very well because of the profits of pharmaceutical companies. And we forget that, but it becomes more significant as we get closer to retirement. So yes, the profit motive is huge. I worry about the profit margin creeping in more and more in healthcare in India. Um, and we're seeing that happen. Um, and the for-profit pharmaceutical industries, you have a lot of pharmaceutical companies. It was actually wonderful at one stage when CIPLA was supporting uh, the use of morphine in particularly Kerala, but with changes in the hierarchy of the CIPLA company and the, um, the uncles retiring or the founders retiring, the next generation became more worried about profits. And I think this is being taped and maybe listened to by someone, but that's okay. I can say that things change because of that, even in India. Um, so pharmaceutical companies, we need them, but we need to be cautious as we go forward. Generic morphine is as good as a brand name morphine, but we need to have an appropriate supply chain that gets this where it is. And we need some way of keeping an eye on it to make sure that it doesn't get diverted. But as the single convention says, that the rules and policies that we have should not actually impede that ability. I remind you at one stage, if a physician didn't get their count right in India, they could go to jail for three years. So there were great restrictions in India. Those weren't changed. They're still in the law, but they've actually, the interpretation and policing has been changed by that law. They realized it was too hard to take that away, but they um, they changed it some extent in the law, but that's how restrictive things were in the 1980s with the change in the laws. Okay. Um, any more questions? Uh, I think uh, time is up for our session. I admire you all on St. Patrick's Day sitting here for hours and uh, listening to a former Irish. No, I must never Irish, but thank you very much for all doing this. It's probably. Uh, Middle of the day in Ireland, uh, sorry, in India now. So, no, it's mid, no, it's late. Go out and have a Guinness. Uh, so, Jim, thank you very much uh, because um, uh, you uh, agreed for this session uh, even uh, between your busy schedule. Uh, so, we actually wanted to have this, uh, to add from you itself. Um, uh, who has worked uh, a lot with uh, opioid uh, uh, availability and access. Uh, and uh, thank you for, for this uh, excellent session. And uh, thank you everybody for uh, attending and uh, for your active participation. Thank you, Jim. Thank you very much. Namaste. Thank you, Dr. Jim. For personally, for me, this was one of the few sessions where I could see the participants smiling even at the end of one hour. So even though I couldn't relate to anything to connected to the medicine, but I could uh, recollect what you said about Sachin Tendulkar. Thank you for that. Thank you so much uh, for taking out time for our participants from your busy schedule. And we do sincerely hope to see you in more sessions in future. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining today. And with the promise that tomorrow also we'll be having another session with yet another eminent faculty. This is Sri Priya along with Dr. Jim and Dr. Surukumar signing off from the Palim India's desk. See you tomorrow. Till then everyone take care. Bye-bye.